things you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, uh, with yourself, with glory, which I had with you before the world was. I'm going to read that again. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. This is what I want to emphasize. I have glorified you on earth. How? I have finished the work which you have given me to do. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Glory be to God. I'm going to go quickly to Joshua chapter, uh, I believe it's chapter 3. Glory be to God. Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. If you're there, say praise the Lord. And if you're not there, say help me Jesus. And if you're still not there, just check the table of contents. Glory be to God. Joshua chapter 3. I will start. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. I will start from. Let me start from this one just for clarity's sake. They just arose early in the morning and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and most there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp and they could I beg your pardon, I believe it's chapter two. I am sorry. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Chapter two. Glory be to God.
from over you today? And he said, yes, I know, it. I know, keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets were at Jericho, came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, he answered, yes, I know, keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me unto Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And the fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance. And while the two of them stood by, by the Jordan, by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that way, so that the two of them crossed over the dry ground. And so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. In John chapter 17, we see Jesus, uh, you know, uh, theologians actually call that John chapter 17, actually they call that the Lord's Prayer. Glory be to God. He was praying because, you know, he's about to go to the cross and everything. And he says something, he says, glorify me God with the glory that I have glorified you with. And then he says, he says, I have glorified you Father. And he says, and how do you glorify me? I have accomplished every work you have given me to accomplish. And one of the ways as children of God we need to understand here we are not merely existing. Glory be to God. To live life is to live a life of purpose. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 it says before you were formed in your mother's womb I knew you. Before you were even a thought in the mind of your parents before you even knew what it means to exist, God says, I knew you. What did he know about you? He knew what he put on the inside of you. He knew what you were created for. And as I always tell people, listen, as a child of God, you need to understand that you are God's investment. Oh, I wish I had a witness in the house of God. You are God's investment, and he is about to get a return on his investment. Glory be to God. You are, God has invested something on the inside of you for his purposes. The Bible says all things were created for his pleasure and they remain as they are. And they remain as they were created for his pleasure. Glory be to God. Amen. You know, people may turn around to you and say to you, oh, my life is my own. You don't have a life. Glory be to God. Yes, that's right. We don't have a life. No. If we're living by ourselves, we're living for the devil. If we're living by, for God, we're living for God. It's simple as. I know it doesn't sound like a politically correct thing to say. Glory be to God. We don't have our own life. Now let's just hold that thought for a minute. Now let's go to Joshua, the Joshua chapter 3 that I've got confused trying to look for. Glory be to God. He says here, now they're about to cross the river Jordan. He says, let there be a distance between you and the ark. Glory be to God. But well, you need to understand, when we're talking about the ark, somebody was carrying the ark. Those were the priests. Yes. Oh, I'm about to yeah. blow our theology in a minute. Listen, the reason why God says let there be a distance was that as long as they can see the ark, they know they're on the right track. As long as you can feel the presence of God everywhere you go, you know on the right track. Yeah. Now, but let me just preface this. Some of us have missed it because we believe when we're on the right track, everything runs smoothly. Yeah. Glory to God. We believe when we're on the right track, God must be in it because everything runs smooth. Oh, it's definitely God. You see how easy it came? Oh, it's got to be God. But we, all we have to do is go back to Exodus. The Israelites are leaving Egypt. Glory to God. They're leaving Egypt. And God saw a quicker way, but ignore that quicker way, to get to the promised land. He saw a quicker way to get to the promised land. He ignored that quicker way and took them through another way that would take them at least 11 days. But 11 days for the Israelites took 40 years. I don't know, somewhere I was reading something and I, I wish I had my notes where my, uh, my journal would be. Uh, 
something about the lessons in life. And one of the things that I read somewhere it was it was uh, I just because I like whenever I see something that's that's going to be beneficial to me or or just a quote I like writing it and stuff like that. And I remember in that quote he says something like this that um, life is about lessons. And if you don't learn your lesson, you're going to have to repeat it. And that repetition, that repetition comes in different forms. And some of the time, and when I began to meditate on that, I thought to myself, I look at my life, and I thought to myself, do you know what? The lesson I'm supposed to learn today, if I don't learn it today, I find myself learning that lesson in a different form. And sometimes I learn the lesson in an easy way, and sometimes I learn it the hard way. And sometimes if you, were, if you were raised like the way I was raised, sometimes I learned the lesson the easy way, and sometimes I learned the lesson with the hand of God, <laughs> by virtue of my five foot two mother. <laughs> Glory be to God. The woman that was nicknamed Thatcher for a reason. Glory be to God. The fastest hands in Africa. I was speaking to her yesterday. Uh, I began to reminisce and she says, I wasn't that bad. I said, you were so bad, you have no idea. <laughs> Glory be to God. Yeah. And they tell me to call my parents to the school. I never called my mom, I called my dad. Glory <laughs> be to God. Because he was the voice of reason. My mom had done justice. Praise God. <laughs> Glory be to God. Glory be to God. He says, let there be a distance. As long as you can see the, the art of the covenant, as long as you can see the signs, what are the signs is what did God tell you? How is it manifesting? What did God tell you? But the other thing that you need to understand is the priest. Who is the man of God over your life? See, God does not anoint people for any reason. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, it says to some he gave a gift unto men. He gave them as gifts unto men. Some apostles, some uh, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and prophets. He gave them for the what? The equipping of the saints. For the work of ministry. Now, when we talk about the work of ministry, everybody thinks they're going to stand behind the pulpit. But a lot of you, your ministry is where you are. Your number one ministry, whether you're a pastor or the Archbishop of Canterbury or anybody, your ministry starts with the way you live. The Bible says we are written, we are living epistles written by God to be read of men. Glory be to God. I'm carrying on on the series called One More River to Cross. Glory be to God. God spoke to us in the beginning of this year, and this year is going to be a year of what? Fulfillment. When we talk about fulfillment, we're not just talking about you just arriving at a destination. Because success is not a destination, it's always a journey. The day you get to a point where you feel you have arrived, you've just begun to fail. The day you feel you've gotten to the point where, yes, now I can rest. You have just begun failure. And I can give you an example of that in the Bible. King David, the Bible says God has given him rest over all his enemies. Glory be to God. But the Bible also went on to say when kings were meant to go to battle, he did not go. It meant that he was at a place where he was comfortable. And so he was walking on the roof of his house and he saw what he shouldn't have seen. And when he saw what he shouldn't have seen, as my mom always tells me, the devil finds work for idle hands. Glory be to God. And he got himself involved in an old sky with, him, with uh, Bathsheba, and we know how the story goes. But it just, it just didn't end there. Because of that simple action, even though God forgave David, the Bible says when Prophet Nathan came to him, the Bible says Nathan pronounced that, listen, you will be forgiven, we won't take the kingdom away from you. But blood will never cease from your household. And all you have to do is look at the household of David and you'll know that it was like a soap. There was treachery. Even his son wanted to overthrow him. His, uh, his uh, son slept with his, with his daughter. And all sorts of things happened in his family only by making one error of judgment. 
Glory be to God. Turn to your neighbor and say, one more ribbon to cross. Come on, turn to your neighbor, one more ribbon to cross. You see, in that Joshua chapter 3, God is telling Joshua to prepare the Israelites and say, listen, you're about to cross into Jordan. Glory be to God. You're about to cross into Jordan, but Jordan is the precursor to you getting to your promised land. And what I'm trying to do with you guys is to prepare you for your success. Jesus says something in John chapter 15. He says something, he says, I want you to bear fruit. Amen? More fruit, much fruit, but not just for you to bear fruit. I want you, that, that fruit, to do what? Remain. I want sustained success. It, it, it tell you, how many of you have read about stories where people just rise up to the top? As soon as they rise up to the top, they have a mighty fall. Well, that's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is about you staying at the top all the time. And when I mean staying at the top, I'm not just talking about monetary value. I'm saying staying at the top in your marriage. Staying at the top in your career. Staying at the top in everything to do with your life. Christ said, I have come that you may have life. And have it abundantly. When he's talking about abundant life, he's not talking about how long the life is. He's talking about a quality of life. Now, when he's talking about a quality of life, he's not talking about a life that is without problems. He's talking about a life that overcomes problems. Amen. Amen. Oh, I wish I had a witness in the A life that overcomes problems. Jesus said it from the beginning. We need to read in between the lines. Jesus says, I will build my church. But the gates of and the gates of hell shall not what? Prevail. There can never be a prevailing if there's no attack. That's good. One of the words I've heard in my life that I will never forget. That has been one of the marks of my life is I would rather go through a bumpy road that will lead somewhere than to go through a smooth road that leads to a dead end. Amen. And the problem with us today as children of God is we're looking for that smooth road. Well, that smooth road always leads to a dead end. When God called us as children of God, He called us to affect the life of people. We always sing that song, Abraham's blessings are mine. Well, the blessings of Abraham is that anybody who comes into the contact with you could never be the same again. It doesn't just, it doesn't just mean that you're going to be preaching to them all the time, preaching the gospel to them. Quite frankly, some people preach, I've been in places where some people are preaching the gospel and I'm embarrassed because their life does not measure with what they're preaching. Glory be to God. Their life does not measure with what they're preaching. And I'm, what I'm talking about, ah, their life, I'm not talking about having success, I'm talking the way they carry themselves. I'm not talking about wearing uh, sandals like in the Bible, as you see in those movies in the Bible, wearing sandals and wearing those sacros, uh, those long dresses, you know, those Jesus movies, those Moses movies. Uh, anyone seen the Ten Commandments? That's not what I'm talking because that's not holiness. Glory be to God. I remember when in my university days, I, I, there was a guy who belonged to a Christian. There were two guys. There's only one I was ready to listen to. There was one guy who would always sit down with me. He gave me the time of the day. He would listen to me. And when I talk about stupid things, trying to negate what Christianity is all about, he would patiently listen to me. And that really caught my attention, that this guy actually listens to me. He's treated me like a person. That the other one who called me a devil. Who looks at me? Oh, you're under the influence of the enemy. <laughs> the devil is pushing you back and forth. <laughs> Glory be to God. What he did not understand was that I was in search for knowledge. Because when I finally gave my life to Christ, the one thing that came to my mind was I've been searching all over for the truth. But the truth was right here. Glory be to God. But it's not where I'm going. Glory be to God. Turn to your neighbor and say, one more river to cross. One more river to cross. Listen, we need to go back to the beginning. When God created Adam and Eve, they were in perpetual bliss. But they weren't lazy. God gave them work to do. They were in perpetual bliss, but they were not lazy. Turn to your neighbor and say, a little sleep, a little, sleep. A little slumber, a little falling of the arms to rest. Well, poverty overtake you. Glory to God. Can I just 
clarify something, it is not godly for you to think, don't think that you're godly if you're living poor. That's true. Now, I'm not a prosperity teacher, but I just want to clarify that. It is not godly for you to live poor. It's wrong. When God, oh Lord have mercy, when God created the Garden of Eden, you see the water that he watered that garden with. Where did it come from? Just read your Bible. One of the waters came from a place where there was gold. One of the waters came from a place where he translated it means overflow. One of the waters came from a place that meant spreading. Glory be to God. So don't think you're being holy. However, don't think that prosperity makes it even better. The way God created it is that money should come through our hands, or best should come through our hands and go to others. Glory be to God. That's what we are called to do. No Christian should be stingy. Glory be to God. If you're a child of God, it is nothing for you to give something to God. It is nothing for you to give something to people. Glory be to God. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Well, it's in the scriptures. But that's still up where I'm going. Glory be to God. Touch your name and say, one more river to cross. One more river to cross. Now, for us to experience what I've been talking about, for us to experience the abundant life that Christ gave to us, we need to go through four stages of life. Glory be to God. And learn our lessons in every step of the way. Glory be to God. Amen. For us to, you see, you find out with the Israelites, as soon as God has been trying to teach them this lesson, and they frustrated God all the way. When they got to the promised land, what did they do? They made a mess of it. They made a complete mess of it. For, imagine 40 years in the wilderness. Learn your lesson, learn your lesson, learn your lesson, learn your lesson. 40 years in the wilderness, they still didn't learn the lesson. God had to wipe out a whole generation. He says, okay, I'll work with this generation. Lesson after lesson after. Bible even says in Judges chapter 3, it says, okay, so that we can learn this lesson, Judges chapter 3 verse 1, it says, there were certain lands that were not conquered by Joshua. And he gave the reason why in Judges chapter 3 verse 1, it says, so that those who do not know war, and I'm coming to that in a minute, those who do not know war will know what it means to fight. In other words, what God is calling us as Christians to do is that you need to fight for what belongs to you. You need to fight for your promises. Not because God is not going to give you your promises, it's because the enemy is trying to hinder you. That's why Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. And so, when we're about to cross this river, we need to understand the river into success, the river into abundance, the river into everything God has promised us. We go through four stages in life. Which brings me to 2 Kings chapter uh, chapter 2. Bible says Elijah was about to leave. Now let's just, and this is, let's leave Elijah, let's focus on Elisha. And go back to Elijah again. Elijah went up onto the mountain. And God spoke to him that Elisha, amen, is going to succeed him. Elijah knew this. God spoke to him. And Elisha was serving him all this while. And it was time for Elijah to be taken up. Amen? And as he was about to go, glory be to God, they were in Gilgal. Or they were off to Gilgal. Glory be to God. Were they in Gilgal or they were going to Gilgal? They were going to Gilgal. He says, he said to Elijah, stay here please. I'm going. Now there's one thing we need to understand about Elijah. Elisha wasn't about the promise that he was going to get. It was about his duty. We need to understand something about Elisha. Elisha was not looking for the double portion of the anointing. Elisha's priority was, I will serve my master. And, we, and that's a lesson that we need to understand. We are not serving God for what we can get. We are serving God because he is God. Yes. When you keep your eye on what your duty is, the promises will come. Glory be to God. When you do your duty properly, for example, somebody is hired as an executive in a company, there are some fringe benefits that come with that. I.e. a car, glory be to God, a house, or whatever they uh, come with, or shares and stuff. 
But that remains un until that. You always have that as long as you are doing your glory to God. As long as we serve God in spirit and in truth, those three benefits will come. And so our focus should not be on the three benefits. Our focus should be on who we serve. Now we serve God by serving people. That's the first thing we need to understand. God will not show up. And if God shows up to any one of us, we'll serve God anyway. Glory to God. But God will put you in a position where you have to serve people. For some of you, you find yourself at work. And the person who's your supervisor, you're, over, you're quite more qualified than that person. Glory to God. God still wants you to serve. Glory to God. We need to understand this. That service is very, very important. If you want people to serve you, you've got to serve. Glory to God. If you say you're a child of God, this is what my wife and I, we do. We serve God and serve the people. But that should be the motto for every child of God. Serve God. And serve the people. Because if you are serving God, it will always translate to you serving people. Yes, yes, and so Elijah's focus was always about serving his master. What was the question? He said, stay here. He says, no, I will not leave you. I am called at this point in time in my life to serve you. And you alone will I serve. Now remember, Elijah is not God. He's just a servant of God. But Elisha served the servant of God because he was serving God. Let me give you another example. Moses. Who was his assistant? Aaron. How is it that Aaron was not the one who God committed to to take the Israelites into the promised land? How is it ordinary Joshua? I tell you the reason why. Because Joshua served Moses. Joshua served Moses. Not just serve, just do my bit and me. He served him, he went the extra mile. Glory be to God. He served him and went the extra mile. I want you to understand, when it comes to fulfillment, you can't be talking about your vision if you're not talking about other people's vision. Yes, amen. Amen. Because when you have your vision, people are going to key into your vision. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says, whatsoever you sow, it's just a simple principle. Glory be to God. We got to learn to serve in the church, serve at work, serve everywhere you are, serve. You're not looking out for what is in it for me. Glory be to God. But as you serve, as you serve people, as you serve your God by serving people, you'll find that these three benefits will come through. Amen. But the first thing we have to understand is that he had to get to Gilgal. Now Gilgal means rolling away. Glory be to God. Gilgal is rolling away, the rolling away of reproach, the rolling away of past experience. The first time that happened was when they left Israel, or, uh, left Egypt. He says, I will roll away the reproach of slavery from you. Glory be to God. But you know, after slavery, they faced all kinds of circumstances to get to the promised land. Glory be to God. And what God was trying to remind them that wherever you go, you are always going to be at a Gilgal. And you must always remember Gilgal because Gilgal was the place where the Israelites always had camp. Glory be to God. It is a place where you roll away the reproach of your past experiences. It's a place where you roll away the reproach of your experience today. Can I tell you something? Like I said earlier, I would rather go for a road, a bumpy road leading somewhere, than through a smooth road that leads to a dead end. I want to encourage you and I want you to understand that every time, every phase of life, there will always be a bad experience. There will always be an experience that will set you back. It will only set you back but not stop you. And it's the lessons that you learn from there. And the question I want to ask you, every setback you face, how many of us have asked God, where are you in this? How many of you have asked God, where are you in this? Because half of the time, God is trying to get our attention. While we're focusing on somebody hurt me, somebody killed me, somebody betrayed me, somebody did this, this, that, and the other. And God is trying to get your attention. Glory be to God. God is trying to get your attention. At Gilgal is a place of rolling away. But also it's a place of total dependence with God. On God, sorry. It's the place of total dependence on God. If you look from in that whole book of Joshua, you'll find that 
the Israelites always battled. That was their place where they planned their battle. And every time they won their battle, all of them, they came back to Gilgal. Glory be to God. They came back to the place where God rolled away. They came back to the place of dependence on God. And how does that happen? Every time you have a success, you come back to God and you give him praise. You're recognizing the fact that it's not me. Yes, I may have gone to school. Yes, I may have had to do a little bit with it, but I'm only partnering with God. We always come back to the place of Gilgal. It's a place of dependence on God. Turn to your neighbor and say, one more river to cross. Well, it's the place of dependence on God. What about the place of failure? The Bible says, in all things, give praise to God. The Bible says, all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord. To them who are what? Called according to his purpose. Well, he says, all things. He didn't say all good things. He didn't say all good things. He said, all things work together. They combine together for the good of the Lord. They combine together. To those who do what? Love him. To them who are called according to his purpose. How many of you are called according to God's purpose? Even if you don't think so, you are called according to God's purpose. Because every human being is called according to God's purpose. Glory be to God. All things, you must always, for you to get to the promised land of your life, for you to have sustained uh, success, you need to always remember Gilgal. Always remember your Gilgal. For some of you, you need to have a point of reference. When you look back, you have nothing to thank God about. Uh, and God for recently, they looked for where he took you from. David had a revelation. He says, I will bless the Lord at what? All good times. All good times. All bad times. All times. I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise will do what? Continually be in my mouth. Jesus says, if I be uh, if I be lifted up, uh, was it Jesus who said it? But if I be lifted up, I will do what? Do you know that you're a soul magnet? As you lift God up, He will create. He will create a situation where people will be drawn to you. And people are not drawn to what you believe, they're drawn to you as a person. Oh Lord have mercy. People are drawn to you as a person. Then they begin to, it's their curiosity that wants to know what is making you tick. Yeah. Glory be to God. Mm -hmm. Turn to your neighbor and say, one more river to cross. One more river to cross. The river of total dependence on God. Now you can't be dependent on God and not pray. Amen. You can't be dependent on God and not fellowship. You can't be dependent on God and not read your Bible. That's why I'm very worried in today's world. People have become Sunday Christians. It is what you live and breathe. Glory be to God. We sing that song, this is the air I breathe. Your holy presence. Remember in that Joshua chapter that we said, as long as you can see the, 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 the ark, a lot of us cannot see the ark of the covenant anymore. What does that mean? A lot of us cannot hear the voice of God anymore. A lot of us cannot hear the voice of God anymore because we become too familiar with God. Oh, God understands. He, he created you, number one, for fellowship. Even if he doesn't want to do anything, he just wants to chat with you. He wants to, he wants to be your homie. He wants to be your buddy. He wants to buddy with you. He wants to rub shoulders with you. He wants to share some revelation with you. I was reading somewhere, and it says the human being the most gifted human being uses about 5% of his brain. The most gifted human beings on earth. Could you imagine that? This is research. The most gifted human beings use about 5% of their brain. That's the most gifted human beings. And a whole bunch of us are using about... Oh, a whole bunch of us are using about... Uh, 0. something percent or some silly, silly uh, figure. Glory be to God. Do you know that when you fellowship with God, God will begin to tell you all the 
need to tap into the thing that will make you use the most of your brain. You see, the reason why I, I, I began to pray, I began to read, and I began to pray. I'm like, okay, Lord, what can this, is there some truth to it? And God opened my eyes to it. The reason why we only use 5% of our brain is because we only do be a little bit of what God has called us to do. Because when you do what God has called you to do, you will use your everything. Because number one, it will be something you enjoy. How many of you do things that you enjoy? And you spend more time on it? For example, those of you, not me, that spent time on the Xbox. <laughs> not me. I'm just saying. Not me. I'm just saying. Xbox 360. Call of Duty. Not me. I'm just saying. Not me. Glory be to God. You begin to, you'll find that you're energized when you do the thing that God has called you to do. But you can't know what God has called you to do. If you're not in fellowship with him. Can I just say something to us? We cannot afford to be Sunday Christians. We can't, we can't afford. If we're singing that song, this is the air we breathe. But the day we said, I was glad when they said unto me, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. Jesus even said it. He said, the city set on the hill cannot be hidden. Ah, there's a place in Zechariah, Zechariah 8 verse 23. He says, in that day, Ten men out of every language, out of every nation, shall grasp hold the skirt of the Jews. He says, we shall go with you because we have heard and seen that the Lord is with you. Glory be to God. We need to understand that we know this is the air we breathe. Uh, we sing that song. This is the bread we eat. You know, bread of heaven. Fill me till I want no more. Well, you're not even feeding on it. A lot of us are anorexic Christians. And we go, ah, that was in the olden days. My Bible tells me Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today. Glory be to God. Tomorrow and forever. <laughs> Praise God. Glory be to God. The gospel according to Sister Maria. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so, he is not convinced. He says, okay. I'm still going to go to that Gilgal. I'm going with you, my master. And then he says, okay, I'm done at Gilgal. I need to go to Bethel. Well, Bethel is what? It's called the house of God. The first mention of the house of God was in Genesis. It was Jacob running away from his brother. And he found himself in a place. Now listen to this, because we need to understand this revelation. Glory be to God. Bethel, the house of God. The first mention of the house of God. Jacob was running away from Esau. He found himself sleeping. He saw angels descending and ascending. And he says, oh my word. This is the place where God is. And the Bible says he named it Bethel. He named that place the house of God is a place that he named the house of God. The church is a place that we call a place. We meet in New Brighton Community Centre. It's the place where we call upon the name of God. Amen? Amen. That is the house of God. Amen. And some people will go to him, well, you don't really need to go to church. That is a lie from the pits of hell. Oh, you can meet anywhere. Well, let me tell you something. There's a reason why in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, he says, he gave gifts unto men. You can't be in a church where nobody, somebody's not anointed to preach the gospel. Somebody has to be called. He has to be that person's life to preach the gospel. Don't go around following all these charlatans. At the same time, I must say there's some people who have big churches who are not called of God, who are thieves, but we'll need God to deal with them. Glory be to God. The house of God. What am I saying? For you to get to your promised land, the house of God must be a priority. Because it's the house of God where you get revelation. Glory be to God. It's the house of God where you wrestle with God. It's the place where you begin to discover some things about God. I found that in my life. When I begin to discover some things about God, it was, it's not really about God. It's God trying to squeeze some things out of me. The house of God is the place 
where God squeezes the deception out of you. You remember, Jacob was called the supplanter, the deceiver. And then when he wrestled with God, God said, "What? you know what your problem is? Your problem is not Esau. Your problem is not Laban. Your problem is you. You've been living a life a particular way, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Cheat and be cheated. Cheat and be cheated. It is time for me to break that cycle. And the problem is, what is your name? Glory be to God. At Bethel, you wrestle with God. It is a place where God begins to squeeze out the thing that doesn't... The Bible says in the Hebrews, it says it will shake the things that need to be shaken. So that the things that, don't, that won't be shaken will remain. The thing that will take you. One thing I believe is this. Character gets you everywhere. I would, rather, I would never know somebody who has a gift and no character. Character is so important. And the only way you can tell character is when you're put in an uncomfortable position. Some of you find yourself under somebody who is younger. By the way, can I just sidestep somewhere? When it comes to the anointing, it has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with gender. It has nothing to do with experience. It just all has to do with God choosing. Glory be to God. God's choosing. And if you look at somebody, because somebody just got ordained today, and you say, well, he hasn't got experience, and God has called you to submit to that person. Glory be to God. We cannot be familiar with the anointing. I've been somewhere where somebody says, there's no anointing in this church. First of all, they don't understand what anointing means. Because anointing, first of all, starts with a choosing. And what we call anointing, when somebody dabs oil on you, so, oh, he anointed me, he anointed me, and you start shaking it. Oh, he anointed me, that's not the anointing, that is just a seal. That is just a mark to say you were chosen for a particular task. Glory be to God. But anyway, Bethel. Bethel is the house of God. And that's the place where we struggle. We wake up in the morning, oh, I don't feel like, how can you not feel like fellowshipping with God? There's a place that Jacob needs and that is my house of God. Even Abraham, when he was leaving Ur of the Chaldees, and God said, I will show you a land. Bible says he encamped between Bethel and Ai. He laid an altar there, because that was the place where he called upon the name of the Lord. Can I tell you something? There's a place where you call upon the name of the Lord, and it's called the church. Jesus Christ says, I will build my church at the gates of hell. In other words, he is saying to you that flesh, that your body, that the devil will try and hinder you from coming to the place of your blessing. And then he moved from there. Jacob, um, Elijah was about to move. He says, I'm going to Jericho. Glory be to God. Once you're equipped at Gilgal and you're equipped at Bethlehem, you're ready to conquer your Jericho. But you know what Jericho also stands for? It stands for the time of waiting upon the Lord. It stands for the time of faith. It stands for the time when you pray for something and you haven't got the answer. Because that means that's the time when you're walking around. You know, the Bible says they had to walk around the walls of Jericho seven times. And on the seventh day, God says, oh, have, you just, have you finished the seventh day now? Now walk another seven times. It means that's the place where you're waiting upon God. And for us to get to our promised land, for us to have sustained uh, success, for us to be blessed by God, we need to have that faith. It is the place of waiting upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. It wasn't something that happened. It, renew their strength for what? It's the strength to wait again. <laughs> Having done all to stand, stand therefore. It's not the strength, I renew their strength to receive the promise. No, it's the strength to keep on waiting. And that's where faith is, because when you wait for so long, you lose faith. And that's why for some of us, when you're, you're believing God for something, instead of the promise to come, a prophecy comes. And God is saying, I'm just telling you to keep waiting. I'm just telling you to keep waiting. Oh, do you remember Abraham? Oh, God, you said you're going to give me a child. He waited. He waited. He waited. God prophesied. Oh, why are you prophesying? God, you're telling me this and that. You're telling me I'm going to have a child. But I only have any answer. Okay, I'll keep waiting. And then he waited. He waited. And then Sarah came up and said, do you know what? Enough of this waiting. Maybe God 
And can I tell us something? Never fill in the gap for God. <laughs> never fill in the gap for God. Because every time you fill in the gap for God, it turns around and burns you. What you would have achieved in five years, it will take you ten years to achieve by not waiting. And you can't tell yourself that is the most difficult part in the journey of life. That is the place where you need patience. When you're, especially for those of us who are married, a where you're needing a change in your spouse, or you're needing a change in a situation, is it God trying to test you? Is it God trying to work in you? Glory be to God. The place of waiting is so powerful. I found out that when I try to eat, not to wait for the promise and go for something else, I end up missing out big time. How many of you, it's like the case of, oh, I want it now, I want it now, and then you've got something and then you realize it's cheaper. If only you waited another couple of days. That's what waiting is all about. That is the most powerful place in the life of a Christian. We're talking about getting to your Jordan, crossing cross over to Jordan and getting to your promised land. Jericho is a place where you're walking around. You walk around the first day, first year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year, seventh year, and then God says, wait another seven years. God has been saying that all the way. You remember Jacob and Rachel? Fourteen years you had to wait. The art of waiting on God. How many of you know that he waited for that Rachel? He waited for Rachel. Well, he waited for Rachel because of Joseph. Because God had Joseph in Jacob. Oh Lord, I wish I had a witness in the house of God. God had Joseph in Jacob. Wait, 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 wait. That is the greatest place of faith. You're waiting for God. Can I give you? Can I give you? Two things about waiting on God in dealing with waiting. When you see, when all your hope, you know the Bible says, and the Bible is very, I love the Bible, we saw that it said, hope deferred makes the heart sick. When you're being discouraged, the Bible says, if this is the way to deal with it, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for the weapons of our warfare are not common, but they're mighty through God, so they're putting down the what? Strong tools. Casting down imagination. every imagination and holding captive every. How do you hold captive the thought that comes to you when you're waiting? The word of God. What did Jesus Christ say? He was hungry. When he, was in, he was hungry. His flesh was hungry. He says, man does not live by bread. Lord, it was the word of God. In other words, what he was saying that, I don't have food right now, but my God has promised. I'll wait for that promise. I'll wait for that promise. Everything I've said today is pointing towards that Jericho. You're waiting for your walls to come down, to, to, to fall down, to the walls of limitation to fall down, the walls that have been holding you down to fall down. You've got to wait. The walking round the walls of Jericho it means waiting. That's why Paul said, having done all to stand, stand therefore. When we look at that, that scripture in Ephesians, where it says, um, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, it's all to do with waiting. Yes, it's to do with spiritual offer, but it's more weighted. Put on the breastplate of righteousness because of your heart. Hope deferred makes the heart. When you allow us in the surroundings, you remember, oh Lord, okay, I'm going to write up in the next five minutes. When you allow what's in on the outside to get on the inside, guess what? The boat sinks. When the water on the outside got into the boat, when Jesus was in the boat with the, with the disciples, it began to sink. When you allow what's happening on the outside to get on the inside, your heart begins to sink. And the only way to deal with that is to use the word of God and also to hold every thought captive. As one of my younger brothers used to say when I said, your mates are doing this, he says, yes, I know my mates are in it, but some of my mates are in prison too. Yeah. And what you've got to look at is when you see everything going ahead of you, and it seems like everybody's overtaking you. Everybody's doing it. You say, yeah, there's some people that are where I am right now. In other words, what I'm saying, thank God for wherever you find yourself. <laughs> Give him praise. It may seem like everybody's overtaking, but still thank God that I am what I am by the grace of God. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Jericho is a place of waiting. 
That is the hardest place. But you will find that you will have the grace, the renewal of the strength now. is that God gives you strength to wait and continue to wait for the promise. He gives you strength not to compromise, to settle for Hagar. Uh, to settle for Israel instead of Isaac. Glory be to God. Then finally you get to your Jordan. That is a place of perpetual bliss. Now, if you're able to go for Gilgal and take Gilgal with you, because let me tell you something, Elisha did not just leave Gilgal. He took the experience of Gilgal with him. He took the experience of Bethel with him. He took the experiences of Jericho with him. And that's why he had the double portion of the anointing. Glory be to God. I want to encourage somebody here today. Total dependence on God. It's not what you say, it's what you do. Total dependence on God. That's your girl gal. Bethel, the house of God. You cannot be in a place where you're never going to the house of God. It's the place where, that's why people rub you up the wrong way because God is trying to refine your character. Whoever steps on your toe is not about them, it's more about you because God is at work. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. And from Bethel to your Jericho. Jericho is a place of waiting on the God, on the Lord. It's a place of waiting for your promise. Glory to God. And that's where real character is really being developed. Let's just rise as we pray. How many of you blessed by the word of God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I really want to encourage us. This is a year of fulfillment. Glory to God. Fulfillment is not just getting somewhere. Fulfillment means you're already on your journey there. I want you to pray right now. We've talked about the four stages. We talked about Gilgal, the place of rolling away, but it's the place where God squeezes out stuff. That's the place where you wrestle with God. We talked about, uh, sorry, that's the place where God, uh, where there's circumcision, sorry, I beg your pardon, where the flesh is dealt with. Bethel is the place where you wrestle with God. Where God now begins to open your eyes to see where you're missing it. Glory be to God. I want us to pray right now. As we're in the house of Bethel, begin to pray, God, open my eyes. Change my, give me a new name, oh God. Whatever is the problem, whatever is setting me back, whatever is making me take one step forward and two steps back, Lord, open my eyes to it. Are you with me? Come on, let's begin to pray. Open my eyes to it. Whatever is making me take one step forward and two steps back, open my eyes to it, oh God. Show me where I'm missing it, oh God. Lord, help me to be totally dependent on you, oh God. Father, as you're praying, begin to ask the Lord to give you the grace to wait for your promise. Wait for that which God has promised you. Give you the grace. He says, lay that weight upon the Lord. He shall renew their strength. It is a strength to wait. Lord, give me the strength to wait for my promise. All of my steps will be at the right place at the right time. 